Thank you very much. This is very exciting. I didn't expect so many people would be here. So it's fantastic and encouraging to know that people are still interested in this very, very important subject that is not over yet. And so many people want to just move on and say war's over. And there are still things that we will be dealing with for many, many years. So thank you very much for coming. I, I really do appreciate that. Um, that was a very, very flattering introduction. And this book is about my last five years in Iraq. It's a personal story and actually goes back a little bit, a little bit earlier. My is in the Middle East actually began quite a bit, quite a bit uh, before that. I, I first moved to the Middle East 12 years ago. And I was, I just graduated from college, and I had, uh, I wanted to be a foreign correspondent. And I thought the best way to do that is to go to the place, to go abroad. I had about $2,000 in my pocket, and I went to Cairo. I thought the Middle East would be the story of the next generation of my generation of reporters. This was 1996, to reveal my age. And I thought, had it been 1986, perhaps I would have gone to Moscow or Poland or something, but it wasn't. It was 96, and I moved to Cairo, and I lived in a very broken down area. I was very poor and was able to learn the language and live, live with people, and it, it surprised the Egyptian authorities somewhat. They kept accusing me of being a spy and a CIA agent and a Mossad agent, and on a, they, I was followed. I was arrested six or seven times, and um, they were always very friendly, you know, just asking me what I'm doing here. And you know, there was no beatings or anything like that. It was just lots and lots of, oh, you're back again. Come on in. <laughs> and um, they, would, they would tap my phones, and I could hear them coughing in the background. And, you know, <laughs> they were not great spies. Black leather jackets, holding newspapers. They, they were very obvious. And um, so after four years there, uh, mostly covering Egypt, and the, peop the area that I lived in had a lot of people from the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a, uh, a fundamentalist organization. It's an organization that's actually proud to be called Muslim fundamentalist because it believes that it believes in the fundamentals of the religion and that over time that will bring it to power. And over time meaning hundreds of years. It has a very long-term perspective. And it's, it's a very powerful, influential organization in Egypt. And I, I was living in this area where this, this worldview was very predominant, and they were welcoming to me and, and tried to get me to, to convert and were always talking to me. And, and um, it was an interesting uh, welcome into what would later become a very important and very timely ideology that, that exploded onto, onto, the, onto world events uh, in, in a much more radical form in Salafi Jihad and in Al-Qaeda. So after four years there, uh, I moved to Jerusalem. And shortly after I arrived, the Al-Aqsa Intifada broke out, the second Palestinian Intifada. And because I spoke Arabic and I had this background, I was quickly sent down to cover the West Bank and Gaza Strip. So I spent the next three years covering uh, Gaza Strip and West Bank and, and mostly doing Hamas, Islamic Jihad, uh, Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, which was really the first combination of, of, of a national movement and a Islamic militant movement, uh, a national movement that, that had previously only done attacks, now had the extra armor uh, and the extra weapon of, of suicide bombings. So it was also seeing this, this mentality progress. Then around 2002, uh, it was clear that the war in Iraq was coming. Everyone was talking about it. It wasn't exactly clear in the region. A lot of people in the region were taken by surprise. It wasn't seen as the impending danger that it was, was uh, seen as by, by many here. It was something, it took a lot of people in the Middle East by surprise. Why, why the focus on Iraq all of a sudden? But it became clear that there was going to be a war. Troops were on their way. So I thought, well, this is going to be the game changer. This is going to be the, the, the story that I came to the region to cover. And I'd already been there for seven years. And now the United States government, my government, my country was going to be involved in a major conflict, historic, probably uh, game changing, regional changing, world changing nearby. And I had to get there. But I didn't have a visa. And the, the Saddam regime was very difficult uh, and very strict in its in its behavior with reporters. Every reporter had to have a minder. 
and they had a limited number of minders who spoke English. So they only limited the number of journalists who were allowed to go there to a handful or, or at the very most a hundred or so. And each news agency in the build-up to the, to the days of the invasion was given one team to report. So CNN got one team, ABC, NBC, newspapers, everyone got a reporter or a group of reporters for, for television's sake. I wasn't one of them. And I was determined, I, well, I'm going to go there anyway. I have, this is what I've been, uh, what I came to the, to the Middle East to, to be involved in. I wasn't going to miss this story. So I took about $20,000 this time, put it in my sock, and bought a bribed officials to get a human shield visa. At the time, Saddam's regime was convincing people, like any of you, to become a human shield. Wait, uh, this is before the invasion, and strap yourself to a power plant or go to a runway and say, don't bomb because I'm here. And I said, well, I'll take one of those, please. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I took it, and I went to Baghdad and did not strap myself to a power plant, but just sort of drifted into the wilderness and started, started staying at Iraqi's houses. I was staying in... Uh, uh, different hotels. I had several different hotel rooms that I had people book under different names. You, you, you get very nervous, or I was getting very nervous as the war was was on its way and everyone was talking about the mother of all bombs and troops and shock and awe and it was going to be the biggest use of, of military firepower in modern history that was about to start raining out of the sky. And I was thinking, well, I'm pretty much on my own out, out here. And in the final days up to the invasion, shockingly to, to me, a lot of the news agencies decided to, to pull their people out. It was a reasonable decision that they thought they didn't want to lose anyone. Uh, CNN was thrown out. I'm sure they would have stayed. Um, <laughs> they are very, very tough. And um, the news agencies did stay, and some of the big newspapers uh, stayed, stayed as well. But other, other news agencies, for, for a variety of reasons, decided that it wasn't, wasn't worth the risk and that they were going to they were going to lose people, and they didn't want that to happen. Uh, I was a freelancer, uh, therefore responsible for my own decisions and expendable and already there. And s then I started reporting. At the time, I was reporting for ABC News. And they were like, well, where did this guy come from? I had a relationship with them before, but when, when the actual bombings started, they, they noticed me a little bit more and uh, were very pleased that um, – that I was there, and at some stage there, I, was, I, turned, I was in this amazing position to be one of the only American broadcasters covering Baghdad during the shock and awe campaign. And it was an amazing experience. It was bizarre on many levels to watch the Iraqi government react. This was this Orwellian state that was trying to pretend that there was no war. And everyone may or may not remember the information minister who um, I used to go to his press conferences every day and who would tell you until he was blue in the face that the war wasn't happening. As you'd be listening to uh, cruise missiles uh, falling around you. And, uh, you know, and he was insistent that, that, okay, it had begun, but they were losing and that the American troops were retreating and they would never make it to Baghdad. And then one of the final days, I was on the roof of the Palestine Hotel. This was right before the statue was pulled down, and we could see American Bradleys on the other side of the river. And um, I was like, they're on the other side of the river behind you. And he says, he leans into me, he says, it's a trap. <laughs> and I said, okay. Never seen again. He's gone. He disappeared uh, along with Saddam and, and other senior members of the government. He actually later was given a talk show on Arab television uh, that was quite popular and he, he uh, to the end def defended the cause and defended the, you know, that the American invasion would, uh, would ultimately be a, a total catastrophe and that Saddam, people would miss Saddam and he, he kept his, his line uh, right until the end. And um, that period set up a lot of, of what would happen because U.S. troops entered Baghdad the government collapsed as if it had never existed, just up into smoke. The officials just disappeared. And looting suddenly began. Tremendous, tremendous looting. And U.S. troops weren't able to contain it. I don't know how. Uh, they've been debate about if there were enough troops in Baghdad to secure Baghdad. 
you would have needed a lot more troops to secure Baghdad. I was standing next to so, so many more that I'm not sure how, how, how realistic it would have been. I was standing next to troops uh, in a tank as they were the, in, the uh, information of the Ministry of Planning was being looted. And the building was being looted and people were coming and going and stealing the vehicles and everything they could rip off the walls. And I was looking with these soldiers who just arrived, surprised they were in Baghdad, but, but excited at the same time. And we were looking at this looting and I was like, well, and, and what are you going to do? They asked, one of the soldiers asked me, do you want me to just start open firing on all these people? Were we going to arrest them? This tank, the inside of a tank is small. Uh, are you going <laughs> to handcuff them to the side of the tank? So they didn't, they didn't do much. Uh, you know, they had secured the capital, and the looting eventually died down, mostly because the Shiite religious authorities at the time, and this was their first real, when they first really made it clear that they intended to, to take over power, calmed things down. The Shiite imams went out onto the streets and told people, in some cases, to return property they had stolen. If there was any theft of private property, that was all not all, but most of it, and much of it was returned. The public property was, was, was never returned. And a lot of the infrastructure was, was damaged. What wasn't damaged in the bombing campaign, which was quite precise, some of it was set back, uh, the, the refineries and, and uh, power grid in this period of looting. Iraqis, by and large, were pleased that U.S. troops had rid them of Saddam. And there was a feeling of optimism. I remember going out on the streets. There was, there was no threatening environment. Sunni Shiites, Kurds were all happy that the tyrant was gone, uh, including Sunnis. Uh, there was a perception that Sunnis lived this grandiose existence under Saddam. Most of them lived just as badly as everyone else and were just as afraid of Saddam, unless they were uh, in the military elite or from Tikrit or a member of Saddam's inner circle. They were all equally miserable. So this honeymoon period began. And when people ask me about the war, they say, well, how's it been in Iraq? How's the war in Iraq gone? And I think one of the most important things to, to understand is that there was, no one, there was no one war in Iraq. There have been five wars in Iraq. And each one was very different. And when you look back, and I've, I've had the, you know, over the last, while writing this book, I've had the opportunity to look back at it, it becomes quite clear that there were five distinct conflicts. The first one was the one I just talked about, the shooting war. Troops arriving, left hook, toppling Saddam, and then we go into the second phase quite, quite quickly where you're nation building suddenly and we're trying to create a state where suddenly nothing existed. The government evaporates and the people ha are engaged in, in looting and then calm down and are uh, anxious with expectation. They want something else. And we have about a year, honeymoon period, where they're waiting for something. And there were a lot of mistakes made in this period that have been widely publicized, but they weren't exactly evident immediately. Some of them were dissolving of the Iraqi army, which uh, military commanders that I've spoken to, many of them say was one of the strategic blunders of this particular period. The others were the, the rush to create elections and, uh, and, and uh, to, to write a constitution when people were still trying to, to grapple with what had happened. And, but the U.S. Was, was on a march and we needed to create a state. And we wanted to, when I say we, I mean Americans as general and the American administration, uh, not reporters, um, and, or not the people in this room necessarily. But there was a sense that the, this is, the country was destroyed and a new system needed to be created and that system should be democratic because over time that would be more stable and that's not an unreasonable thing to to want. So elections were held and a constitution was written and it was an actually a very good constitution. It was one of the most uh, enlightened in, in all of the Middle East. It gave, it had a bill of rights, it guaranteed uh, uh, an exceptional for, the, for that region, a uh, number of, of authorities to, to women, guaranteed them a role in, in politics and in society it was one of the, the more progressive constitutions written in the Middle East. And then elections took place. And there was a, a feeling uh, that things were changing. It started to, 
it started to enter, and that's really the second, the, the second war, when you have a nation building, and they had so many advisors coming in. This was the Bremer administration, people who I think were, were good intentioned, but didn't necessarily know where they were, and they were trying to, a lot of academics, a lot of very smart people came from universities in the United States to help the Iraqis form a new society and write a constitution and hold elections. And the, the UN and the, uh, the TAL, this transitional, uh, the, the UN and other advisors and, and the, the US uh, administration there came up with a, a guideline to try and bring this country forward and to uh, establish a, um, a new political system. Then it started to change, and it happened quickly. April 2004, we go into the third war. And there was a period before April 2004 and a period after. And April 2004 is when the insurgency really began. And the insurgency began partly because there was this vacuum period and there was a promise of democracy. And the Sunnis, particularly the Sunnis who were in the army, who had lost their jobs, felt very betrayed. And, and a lot of them told me personally, a lot of senior commanders said, we felt betrayed. And there had been promises made, thousands, tens of thousands of leaflets dropped on Iraq during the invasion saying, if the Iraqi military doesn't fight, it will not be destroyed. You are not the objective. And a lot of Iraqi commanders did that. They went home, they didn't fight, and that's why, also because of a, a lot of, you know, what has been described as a, as a, as a brilliant um, military plan to, to invade, was it carried out, but also a lot of commanders decided to just go home. And then they found themselves the next day without jobs. And if you were an Iraqi in the, a general in the Iraqi military, in a dictatorship that is fundamentally a military dictatorship, or was, you were something incredibly important. And you had servants and houses, and you had the power of life and death over people. And suddenly you're left on line, which is what I saw this, waiting in a dusty hot line for some corporal from the US Army who doesn't speak your language to give you an unemployment check. And a lot of them took that badly, as you could imagine, and decided they didn't, have make, they didn't really make a decision, but they decided this is not right. So we have a, military, a militarily trained elite that is disgruntled and angry. There was also a sense, a growing sense, among Sunnis in general that this democracy thing might not be good for us. We are 20, 25%, 20%, 18%, no one exactly knows, but let's say 20% of the population. And elections are gonna be held and the Shiites are gonna win and we're gonna lose. So there was a general dissatisfaction uh, among some of the Sunnis that the Shiites have, have had a, a rough time over it over the last few years and they might come back for us. And there was a particular antagonism within the military, which is a dangerous group always to alienate. And then something brought it all together. You had foreign fighters with a much more sinister agenda, guys like people like Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, a Jordanian with an al-Qaeda mentality who was able to come in, and others, others like him, mostly coming in through Syria, and bring it all together. So you had a disenfranchised population, a disgruntled, elite and a, a few very evil people who decided there was an opportunity here. And in April 2000, it burst onto the scene with the kidnappings and murders and people like uh, the American Nick Berg. He was kidnapped and then beheaded in, in an internet video. American contractors from Blackwater USA were taken. All the time, we had a team of reporters kidnapped. All the time, there was uh, a tremendous amount of from that point on, violence, mostly from the Sunni community, but particularly from the military and foreign fighters. And that period of the insurgency was very, um, was, was, was quite brutal, but it was still in its infancy. They were IEDs, I remember now, with, with some degree of nostalgia that were small. And they would be, some of them were the size of a Coke can. And they would leave it by a, a tree or, or by a vehicle to, to, to kill or injure one soldier. And there was attacks where someone would come up on a market and just fire on a soldier. And there was this starting this movement. But as the foreign fighters gained in, in clout and gained their, their understanding of the conflict, 
it started to get much more violent. And th mostly through people like Zarqawi, they started to attack Shiite civilians and Shiite religious leaders. And there was a, just a, a tremendous amount of beating against the Shiite community. Their, their uh, mosques were being blown up, their religious leaders were being killed, the Americans were being targeted, and there were several major offensives in, in, in Fallujah, and there was uh, offensives in Ramadi, and the Sunni community was quite militant and militarized. At a certain stage, things snapped, and you go into the fourth war. So if the first war was the, the shooting war, second war was nation building, third war is the insurgency, fourth war is civil war. The Shiites decide they're going to fight back. And a lot of people have looked back at the Samara incident where there was the destruction of the, the Golden Shrine. It was a turning point in that what it was an insurgency became a civil war. The Shiite militia groups started fighting back and for the first time you had civilians killing civilians. Ethnic cleansing of neighborhoods. I was there would be 70 unidentified bodies in Baghdad a day. And it was a, a horrific uh, time. I remember going around to places where the bodies were dumped and they were tortured. Uh, and once the neighborhoods become more segregated, it, you can use other tactics. You can do car bombs in markets because you know you're going to get everyone who's there is probably a Shiite. Or you can fire mortars into neighborhoods once you've separated out the populations. And that period has gone on and has continued for, uh, for, for a long time uh, until you entered the second, the, 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 fifth, the fifth war. And this, this, one, this, this one in particular, the, the, the Civil War period, had a dramatic impact on, on society. Uh, it displaced all of the refugees. There are now about four million refugees are internally displaced, all of it as a result of this terrifying period where people were afraid to to leave their homes. Uh, the, a translator who, who I worked with, um, he's not a translator, I speak Arabic, but he's a, um, a fixer. Uh, his name is Ali. Ali is a Shiite sounding name, it is a Shiite name. There are some Sunnis named Ali, but not very many. And he changed his name like other people who would carry fake identity papers. Um, he has had to operate in secret for a long time. His father was kidnapped, is presumed dead, he himself was then kidnapped, was tortured for about eight hours. He eventually decided to leave and is now in Sweden, now, uh, trying to have political asylum. And he took all of, he didn't even tell me he was going and we're very close. I got a cell phone call from him one day and he said, uh, Richard, I'm in Sweden. I said, what are you doing in Sweden? I said, well, I'm in Sweden. Yes, how did you get there? And he spent all of his money on a smuggler to put him in the back of a truck. He said people were passing out from the heat next to him. And they got him to Sweden, and now he's kind of stuck there. It's better. Uh, it's nice. He's in a little tiny village eating herring, I guess, and uh, <laughs> swimming. And, uh, but he can't work, and he's just caught in limbo. And there are many, many people like him. Some of them are in, much, in, a, in a much worse situation. In Syria, uh, one of the most disturbing stories I ever had to cover was a nightclub on the outskirts of Damascus where on a stage dancing are all of these young Iraqi girls, refugees, and young, some of them are nine, ten, and they're for sale. And not for slavery, but for, for the night. And it was, um, there are a lot of people whose lives, who, that's what I said initially, for whom the, the war will, is, not, is not over now and, and might not be over for some time. This period of what we call civil war uh, we at NBC, uh, which was a statement that a lot of people found controversial, continued until you had a very radical change of military strategy and a radical change of policy, which was generally known as the surge. It began a, roughly a year ago. And it was a new tactic, a new strategy, to, and a new general that was in charge. General David Petraeus arrived and he had a new battle plan. For most of the war, once the insurgency began and there was a, a, an enemy that was fighting Americans wherever they, wherever they were, the U.S. troops would be on a few big fobs, forward operating bases, go out in, into the city, patrol, make arrests, do whatever they would do on, a, on an average 
cordon and search mission or cordon and knock or, a, or it could be a hearts and minds mission. And then they would go back to the base at night and the area where they were would not be secured by anyone and death squads and militia leaders would come in and kill people. And that's when a lot of the, the, these assassinations would take place, would be uh, at night, under the cover of darkness. You'd go into someone's house. You'd, if they didn't leave, then they would be killed. And, and there was also a criminal element to it. It was profitable for some people to engage in a degree of, of ethnic, if not ethnic cleansing, certainly ethnic violence, to push someone out of their house and then take all the possessions. So uh, the, the financial aspect, the, the war profiteering, helped drive this period along. General Petraeus had a different strategy, and it was to bring in enough troops, more troops, so that he could not have them concentrated on the big fobs, but spread out in lily pads across Baghdad and in other cities, a similar pattern, and not have them commute back and forth, but to live 24-7 in theater, in, on the front line. But to do that, he needed more money, and more troops. And that was a tremendously, con tremendously controversial decision. A lot of people in the United States were against it. They thought, this is throwing more, more uh, good money after bad, and we should just not do this. This, is, this will not work. The president, despite this, uh, this sentiment uh, shared by, by a number of Americans, decided to do it. And the surge went forward. And General Petraeus came and spread out the troops and it worked. Violence dropped 70% as a tactical procedure because it wasn't just the extra troops and spreading them out. There was the, that group that had fought the Americans initially in 04 had become its relationship with Al Qaeda, the, the, the military, the tribesmen, the Sunnis who were afraid initially and had looked to foreign fighters to energize and mobilize them that marriage was, was, was breaking up, and Al-Qaeda had behaved badly. It, it, it was imposing tremendously uh, or, or fundamentalist laws in a country that for, for most of its time was, was a secular dictatorship. You couldn't wear shorts. One of our staff was beaten to, within an inch of his life because he was wearing shorts uh, while, while at home. Uh, another person who worked for us was beheaded, and it was an incredibly... They were not good hosts. And you, 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 you couldn't mix tomatoes and cucumbers together in the same bag because in Arabic, tomato and cucumbers are, one is a, sec a male noun and the other is a female noun, and this was somehow seen as commingling of the sexes. And they had a lot of uh, bizarre and, and unpopular ideals that strained the relationship. The new command was to capitalize on that. We employ now, currently, about 100,000 people, we meaning the U.S., specifically the U.S. Army and the U.S. Marines, Sons of Iraq is what they're called, and they had a variety of names. They were called Concerned Local Citizens, they were called uh, the Baghdad Patriots, they were called the Minutemen, now they're, they were called the Awakening Council initially, and it was this initially disenfranchised Sunni movement that General Petraeus and others were able to bring on to the Americans' side by, for a variety of reasons. I think there are three motivations for the, the sons of Iraq. One uh, would be that some of them legitimately didn't like al-Qaeda, think they made a mistake, and wanted to move forward in their nation. And that's laudable, and there's, it's, it's, there's quite a number of them. The other would be people who just wanted a job and were happy to take a paycheck. And the third would be people who, Sunnis in particular, who decided... If we don't do this, we're going to be overrun by Iran because throughout this period, starting right from the election, Iran has been moving in, uh, not with numbers and troops, but with influence. Throughout the last five years in Iraq, the, the military, the U.S. military, has focused on fighting bad guys. It's a phrase they love to use, bad guys. And they have been focused on establishing institutions like securing the elections. And uh, of late, they've been trying to build hearts and minds campaign. That has now uh, begun uh, once again in, in a major way. Iran started its hearts and minds campaign, campaign right in the beginning. 
And while the U.S. was preparing the ground to hold elections, Iran was trying to make sure that its favored candidates won the elections by buying off politicians, by opening charities. If you needed, if you wanted to open a women's work center or a literacy group and you needed $100,000, you could go to Iran and get it quickly, come back, no questions asked, no audits. And from people I, I've spoken to who did this, they didn't even ask anything. It was sort of like the, you know, one day we will come and ask you a favor from your godfather and you will say yes. <laughs> uh, but it wasn't more formal than that. So Iran, over the years, had come to be tremendously influential. And that frightened a lot of the Sunni, particularly people in the military, who had fought Iran in, in, a, in the Iran-Iraq war. They joined the Sons of Iraq program, 100,000 strong. So now Petraeus has the extra troops, he has them spread out, and he has 100,000 people who were formerly his enemies now fighting alongside of him. Violence goes down dramatically. But he also has the new Iraqi army. The Iraqi army has proven to be a fairly effective fighting force, not like the interior ministry or the police, which are, are known for being infiltrated by militia groups and, and, and corrupt beyond belief. But the army has, despite some, some very serious growing pains and running away from some battles, has proven to be, with each year, more capable and more effective. So when Petraeus, when you talk about the surge and why violence dropped, he has the extra men, he has them spread out, he has the Sons of Iraq program, which is 100,000. He has new Iraqi soldiers who are helping out. And he has the full support in President Bush of this policy. So that's where we are now. And violence has gone down, and things are a lot better. I was just in Iraq. I just came back this weekend, and I can go out more. I can walk around more than I used to. A restaurant opened down the street from the bureau. It's Chinese. And it's good. And um, I was just in Najaf recently, walking around without security, which is something I hadn't done in a long time. And you see more kids on the street, and people are, the soldiers are getting thumbs up again. And that has helped their morale tremendously. There was a period in 06, early 07, 05 even, when the soldiers would keep coming back deployment after deployment and see the areas they were returning to worse than when they left them. And that has a tremendous, has a, has a significant impact on their, on their morale and their sense of mission. It was as if the, what they did last time and what they sweat for and some of them died for was for nothing if they come back and find it worse. Now they're coming back and finding there is improvement. Areas where they secured are staying secure. And they, that has given them a tremendous boost. So where are we now? And that's the, so if, the, if, the, if you go back and look at the, the five wars, first one, the shooting war, then nation building, then the insurgency, then the civil war, then the surge, five. What's the sixth war? Because this one isn't gonna last forever, it can't. U.S. troop levels are going down. There's a variety of factors on the ground that could change. The sons of Iraq could change their allegiance again. Iran could uh, have a, have a, a game-changing philosophy. There could be a major Al-Qaeda attack that, that Al-Qaeda in Iraq has not gone away entirely. You could have another Samara-type incident. So right now we are in this, in this war, and violence has gone down, and it's, it's holding for now. But how do you get into the war number six, which is an exit strategy? And everyone says it's got to be an exit strategy on all sides of the debate. And I think what the U.S. Uh, military and the next administration are going to have to debate is how does that exit strategy take place? Is it quick? Is it long? What is it ultimately going to? Is it, we are about 150,000 troops now, plus all of these other programs. Do we bring the troop levels down? Is the goal to bring them down to 100,000 in two years? 50,000 in two years? 20,000 in two years? And, and I think that's what people are trying to debate. That's where the real policy debate is. How steep will that downward co curve be? And I, everyone would like to know what would happen if you pull out a lot of the troops. Will the violence go right back up? 
the, the war and this war has been a living thing. It's been very hard to predict. So if over time troop levels have to go down, I think you'll see a situation where units are pulled out, people watch the situation, some more units are pulled out, they watch the situation, and that time piecemeal approach could take a very long time. Or we could have a radical change, and they're, they're cut back to dramatically low levels. These decisions I will just be watching. And um, with that, I would love to ask you if you have any questions. <laughs> just the, uh, just the, the caveat, um, we're going to try and do about uh, 20 minutes or so of questions. Please keep your questions brief and make it a, a question, and as I mentioned earlier, not a philosophical discussion, okay? Right. Yes, sir. Yes, and you have seen recently what could be a very dramatic transformation of Maliki. When he was first, when he first became prime minister, everyone dismissed him as an Iranian stooge, and he refused to take on Muqtad al-Sadr. He has a very strong alliance with the, the Sadr movement. And he was uh, sharply criticized for not doing anything against the, the Mahdi army, uh, the Sadr Shiite militia. Then recently in Basra, and then after that in Sadr city, he went after the military. Uh, he went after the Mahdi army in a way that surprised and pleased a lot of Iraqis, including Shiites who were not happy that this radical ideology of the Mahdi army, which, has, which shares some of its um, social politenesses with Al-Qaeda in, in the way that it be you no know, music, no nothing, and that's not popular in Iraq. People like to go out and drink and listen to music and get married and have music at their weddings like many people do. The Mahdi army doesn't. And it's not a lot of fun. So that changed and surprised people. Is it because he is concerned that there could be a, a change in U.S. strategy? I think we're seeing that from a lot of different actors right now. The, the region and Iraq in particular, Iraqis and the government are watching what happens in the United States and are not waiting for it. They know something will change, so that's why they're taking gains now. The Kurds are establishing their own state and have dug what could be, looks like a moat around Kurdistan to keep people out, but also to secure their area. They're signing foreign oil deals. Part of the reason that the sons of Iraq are joining up with America is that they realize, we better do this now while the Americans are still here and are strong, otherwise we're gonna have nobody. And the Shiites and Maliki are all trying to stake their claims because there is a sense that things could change and things, things are going to be changing. Okay. Mind if I take one from, the, from you, please? I'll just go back and forth. To have three separate, what they're trying to do is have a, the, the, the Kurds are, are they're a busy nation building and, and the, um, there is a sense that what, what, what all three sides have agreed on is that they should have a federal state and that there should be a central government and then provinces. Kurdish province, what effectively would be a Sunni province, Baghdad as the capital, and then Shiite provinces in the south. The question is how many, what are the, how are the powers shared among them? This, the, the classic right, the classic debate that the U United States had, states' rights versus national supremacy. Who gets to control the oil resources that are mostly in the Kurdish areas and in the south? Where do taxes get collected? Where do the borders form? Can these regions form alliances among themselves and become mini-states? Can they form treaties with foreign nations directly? Do they have the right to leave the Union? All of these issues are still undecided. No one, except for some even radical Kurds, think that they should break away and create an independent nation. It's, it's a federal state, but how loose it is is something that, that they have been um, 
debating and, 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 and to a degree fighting over. I'll just, sorry. <laughs> sure. This is all going to take. This is all going to take another hour to get into. All right. Uh, all right. <laughs> well, let me start with the, the, the last one. Uh, no, let me. The, uh, the Bremer administration versus the first administration of, of Jay Garner. The Bremer administration, the Garner's administration never really had a chance. It was only on the ground for, for a very short period. I, I don't think it was ever given a, sh a shot to do very much. Um, looking back in, in, in retrospect, it, its influence was was fairly negligible. It was important in some of the selection of the of the players, getting them to Baghdad. People like uh, Ahmed Chalabi or a lot of the uh, other parties that were brought in by the U.S. forces. I wouldn't necessarily say that was just the the first administration, but it, it set the tone for going forward because a lot of the politicians who ended up doing uh, doing well in the elections were from these outside parties. They were from Iranian-backed groups, so they were from, uh, they were exiles in, in the UK or Syria or Iran. So I think if his administration had any impact, it would have been before the war in helping to set the groundwork for later. I have no idea. I mean, he, he wasn't on the ground very long to, to make much of an impact. The second one, if I remember, could you remind me? Uh, the Status of Forces Agreement. Uh, and the Status of Forces Agreement is something that I think a lot of people are very nervous about, and there was a discussion of that today in Iraq as well. What it is to the, – the goal of the Status of Forces Agreement, and it's not just a Status of Forces Agreement. It's, a, it's an economic, political, and, um, and social agreement between the U.S. and Iraq to try and establish a future relationship that will not necessarily be one of direct military support. And a lot of unanswered questions have to be resolved from a legal point of view. How do you have 100,000, 150,000, 80,000, whatever the number ultimately turns out to be, in a foreign country that is supposedly fully sovereign? Who gets to decide if those troops can leave their bases? Who gets to decide are they subject to Iraqi law? Can they be arrested and, and prosecuted? And some of the things that, that, I've, that I've heard from negotiators debating is that there wouldn't be permanent U.S. bases, but that there would be a U.S. presence on Iraqi bases, and that we would technically be guests on Iraqi bases, and that some of the negotiating points are how many? I don't think this agreement will set any number of troops. It'll set the parameter for keeping troops in the country if it were to be necessary. So everyone I've spoken to about this agreement says they won't, it won't say we're going to have long-term bases in the country, but that U.S. troops will have access to Iraqi bases and freedom of movement and freedom out to carry out uh, independent operations within clauses one, two, three. But it, it obviously has many people concerned that this is a long-term commitment to maintaining forces in Iraq. And the way that people are involved are, are describing it is a it is a framework that could allow troops to stay or not. Uh, please. And the Turkmen as well. And there's uh, yeah, there's many people. Yeah. <laughs> Very small Jewish community. I think it's like 20 people. 
I've met I've met them. They they were like it was 20 people, which is another trap. There used to be 150,000 of them. The um, there is a sense that that Sunnis and Shiites are like cats and dogs, and they would just naturally fight because of their their nature, and that's not the case. Uh, there are many Iraqis are, are intermarried, and many Iraqis uh, within tribes. Uh, there are Sunni sides of the tribe and Shiite sides within the same tribe. There is much a much greater divide between the Arabs and Persians. Everyone in Iraq is. Arab, with the exception of some Turkmen. It is an, there are Arab Sunnis and Arab Shiites. The bigger rivalry is between the Persians in Iran, and that is a much more historical, a historic divide, going back to when you had the Ottoman Empire, which was a, a Sunni multi-ethnic empire, and you had the Persian Iranian Empire. There was a tension between the two, and the fault, ra fault line ran right through Iraq. And it does once again today. There's almost a Cold War dynamic that has been set up in the modern Middle East that we're experiencing, where you have the Sunni Arab world on one side, mo mainly Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, vying for dominance of the Middle East versus Iran, the, the Persian power. And a lot of it centers on not just Iraq, but the what the Iranians called the Persian Gulf and what the other side called the Ara Arab Gulf. <laughs> and it is center, and, and not coincidentally, it is where all of the oil is. So it, there is a, 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 a split. And this, this global tension that has been brought out because of uh, empowerments of, of Shiites in Iraq is, is one of the reasons why you're seeing such intense animosity at times between Sunnis and Shiites in, in, in Iraq. A lot of people on a, on a family level, on a personal level, really don't care. He was, a, he was secular Sunni, but he, he was more about Saddam Hussein than, than anything. <laughs> Please. I think when, when talking about oil as a factor it's, it is very much a factor. I can only talk about within Iraq. People talk about oil as a factor. Did we invade Iraq because of the oil? That is a, uh, I have, that's, those, are, those are discussions were, I don't know, I don't know. I can tell you it is a factor right now. Iraq is, there is a lot of oil in Iraq. The uh, Iraqi government just announced, or a senior official from the Iraqi government in Sharm el-Sheikh, that Iraqi oil reserves are greater than the oil reserves of Saudi Arabia. That is a bold claim. And a lot of the fighting you see, particularly in Basra, is for dominance of the very lucrative oil smuggling market. The Mahdi army dominates, and the Badr Brigade, another usually more powerful rival that is more deeply entrenched in the government, vie for control of this critical industry. There have been reports, uh, our reports, that, uh, that I got from, from very well-placed sources that hundreds of thousands of barrels a day of oil, up to 500,000 a do, uh, uh, dollars a day, 500,000 barrels a day of oil and oil products is unaccounted for every day. And it is a very, if you do the math, uh, at whatever the oil price is today, and oil products price, which is even more expensive, you can see how this would be a, a very lucrative thing. And there is a, a degree in Iraq that part of the, the reason, another reason why things are more stable now is to allow this corruption to take place because when there's total anarchy, it's, it's hard to, to deal with corruption because you can't, trust, you can't trust anybody in a situation like that. But you have, where you have a minimal level of violence, you can always blame that pipeline that blew up in the desert and all the oil spilled out on some unknown terrorist when you have a, when you have a, a 20 or 30 percent level of, of, of chaos in the country. So it, it does, uh, the, the oil factor is real. Whether the United States invaded Iraq to secure its oil fields and uh, that, uh, that is, uh, I, I can't answer. I don't know. I 
I heard. <laughs> <laughs> The first one, yes, I was surprised by that. I didn't, I didn't think that the editing, I, I don't know if everyone saw, saw this piece, or it was in, there was an interview with the president, and he didn't like, or the White House didn't like the way his first answer was edited. Every interview that the president has ever given, a media interview for a nightly newscast, is edited for time, as was this one. And, and I don't think that the content and the, that the reporting on what he said was, was changed. So uh, the position that we took was that you know, we didn't see it, that um, we had posted the interview online before anyone asked us to, the entire thing. So if you're trying to be deceitful, and then we told everyone that it was online, and it was in, in its entirety on the Today Show, on the weekend Today Show, moments after the interview. So it did air, and it was posted in its entirety online, and we told everyone where to go. So if you had a a crime to hide, that wouldn't be a great way to go about and do it. So we obviously felt that there was nothing to, nothing to be ashamed of and that we were you know, proud, of, proud of the interview. Have I ever felt for, felt, feared for my life in Iraq? Yes, um, uh, many, many times. I've been very fortunate and, and lucky. I had uh, dinner and drinks yesterday with uh, Kimberly Dozier from, CNN, from CBS, and I saw her again today, who was almost killed out there. And it's just... She happened to be standing next to a bomb that I've been next to bombs, but I've been further away, and we're in vehicles. So we, a lot of it has to do with luck and math. So, uh, no women? Can, I, can we ask a woman, please? <laughs> what does over look like, and how can you disturb the over fizzles out. Over isn't over. It's not a declare victory moment. I th although I think people will declare victory one way or the other. I think over means, if you look at that downward trend, how fast is it? Is it just staying the same to, to maintain a level of calm? And if we're, in, if we're at 150,000 troops in two years, that, that, then there's been a serious problem. And I don't think the U.S. military has any intention of doing that. I don't think they can sustain that. And, and of course, this is from interviews with very senior commanders. They all know they want to go down, and even starting this summer, troop levels will be going down. It's just how, how steep that is. So I think over is a very l few number of troops for a prolonged period of time. And how, what can Americans do? I think just, just stay interested. Uh, people are, the, are tuning out. There is a perception that people in America have Iraq war fatigue and don't want to hear about it anymore. Personally, it's very discouraging. <laughs> so uh, I, I, that's, I think, uh, that if people want to become more informed about it and just stay be, uh, informed because it is something that is going to be with us for, for a long time. And, and the, imp the, the, the implications and the ramifications of this war ha haven't been felt yet. Please. had not been there at all, meaning never been in Iraq? Well, no, that they had, uh, if they had a pullout a couple of years ago and not had um, them doing what they were doing. I think you still would have had a situation with, with massive chaos. Um, if you had pulled out all of the troops lock stock when there was no alternative and there was no system of government, uh, you had created a vacuum in the Middle East. Someone was going to fill it. Quite a bit, um, but it's usually not just an average person going out and protecting their neighborhood, although that does happen. You, it, it tends to be militia groups that do that kind of thing. Most people are, are frightened when there's chaos in their, in their neighborhood, and they want to band together, but individuals don't necessarily do that kind of thing, or at least they don't in Iraq, so you have gangs. So that's one of the reasons that you had a militia like the, the Mahdi army, is that no one was providing security, so they decided to provide it. That was one of the reasons that you had militia groups on the 
Sunni side, Al Qaeda, and there wasn't just Al Qaeda in Iraq. There were dozens of radical. There was the Jaish Mohammed. There were there were many many different groups. No, these were like gangs. These were like street gangs. Today, like each 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 phase has been very different. Under Saddam, women had the same fate as as other people. It wasn't a particularly, it wasn't like the Taliban in 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 Afghanistan. Women could go to school and did and were highly educated and that and were represented in government. That there were other problems with the regime. That one wasn't one of them, to a to a large degree. When society collapsed. And you have a breakdown of all of the, the laws and the the social norms, and all of this vendetta is rising to the surface. Unfortunately, it reverted people back to their traditional tribalism and chauvinism, and it was very difficult for women. If as things got raw, a lot of a lot of the violence may have been. Not directed at women, but women may have suffered more than than others because it created it, it drew out the worst in people and and the worst in a, in a in a society that was very traditionally chauvinistic and, and even maybe misogynistic. So, it um, it has been a rough a rough ride for for women. Right now, as things are getting better, women's status and, and rights are also improving in, in that in that equation. But you see an interesting development in that Al Qaeda in Iraq. Which has had problem, problems recruiting and, and problems with popularity is increasingly relying on female suicide bombers uh, as a tactic because they don't get women don't get pat down and they can get through checkpoints and there are more checkpoints. So as it gets more difficult, once again you're seeing that uh, women are, are um, uh, ending up with the short end of the stick to another woman. <laughs> Five to eight years. <laughs> Uh, I, I've been changing my job movements a little bit recently, and for the first four years, I was just in Iraq, and I would do Iraq and take a little break, and then Iraq and take a little break, and Iraq and a little break, and that's all I did. And then for the last year, I've been doing Iraq, another assignment, Iraq, another assignment, Pakistan, Afghanistan, whatever, and then come back. I think going forward. I'll just be expanding my coverage and doing more. I mean, Iraq will remain a, a centerpiece. If you're a foreign correspondent, you have to cover what are very important stories, and Iraq will remain an important story. But I don't think I'll be there straight for the next five years. I'm going to have to try and, and, and I want to try and expand to to other places. There's a, there are tremendous number of stories out, out there, and even already now you're seeing Iraq, the Iraq story expand. I don't have uh, just keep keep doing. Oh yes, I'm the chief foreign correspondent now of CNN, of, of, CNN, of, of NBC. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, we're in Atlanta. I was just talking to them. <laughs> uh, well, I've been, please, sir. Well, I think that is one of the factors that is in the in the domestic debate right now, and that is something that will undoubtedly be di be discussed and and be influential as people choose their leaders, choose the rate of withdrawal, and whether they can af whether we as a nation can can afford to do this. Do we have a moral obligation to do it right? All of these factors are going to be. Are going to be counterbalanced, and uh, and I think that you know, as, as clearly, I, mean, I don't I don't live here, but everyone tells me it's getting harder. <laughs> so, please, I, th I think yes, un undoubtedly, that will be part of it. Uh, young, young. Yeah. Uh, 
it has been everything that I've done. And uh, when you, when you rep it's, it's unlike other reporting jobs. You don't just go there and go home at night. We live in a, in a bureau, uh, and we live in the bureau. There's nowhere else to go. And we go out reporting. I, I go out of the bureau every single day. But the bureau is a small Iraqi hotel, and we've created a, you know, a better lifestyle for ourselves. There's a pool there. We put a gym, pool table. We cook for ourselves. And that is our life. And we go out, and sometimes it feels like you're going out of a castle, going into the Badlands, and then you retreat back to your castle. Our castle's been blown up twice. And um, it is it is an all-consuming lifestyle. And my own personal experience has, has ridden this wave of, of, the, um, of the war from when I was uh, exhilarated and, and excited and, and nervous and full of energy and expectations watching the troops arrive to a period where I was curious to see how this nation would stand to a, a time where I saw the darkness uh, in, I think, the worst that human beings can do to each other. And now, again, it's back into curiosity. I don't know how it's going to end. I don't know how these decisions in America are going to play out and, and what, will, what, what that will mean for the, for, the next, for the next war that we're going to be experiencing, the sixth war. What would I tell him to do? What would I do? Yeah. No, I think it's. I, I think it's quite. It, I, I think you need to engage. You need to have a degree of. There's. There's a thing that's debated in the Middle East. It's called the grand. Uh, the grand bargain, and it is effectively aggressive negotiations that involve everybody. Everything is on the table, from a reaching an Israeli-Palestinian peace deal to Syria to the fate of those 150,000 Jews, many of whom still claim property in Baghdad, to the Christian community, to Iran, the resolve, the, um, the, the dispute over the, uh, the Persian Gulf. It, it is a very ambitious project. And I'm not saying do it all in one day, do a new Treaty of Versailles, although I think a lot of people have advocated that, including, including myself. But you need to have a, an overarching strategy that is not only dealing with Iraq and dealing with the Israeli-Palestinian issue as a separate. That in the region, they don't see them as separate. In the region, Syria and Lebanon and that conflict are not seen as separate from the struggle uh, for dominance with Iran and are not seen with Saudi Arabia's uh, issues with the United States. So it would be a global, a more global, a more Middle Eastern, pan-Middle Eastern approach that can have carrots and sticks. I'm not assuming everyone there is going to suddenly agree to this big swap meet. But they, there are many people in the region who do want to settle things and who are naturally concerned about Iran's ascendance and who are – and Iran has natural and, and quite some of them legitimate interests in Iraq. In its trade, it is a bordering nation. It, it has uh, religious ties. Many Shiite religious centers are in Iraq. And the, the, the relationships between Iran and Iraq for, for a very long time have been treated as if it's criminal, that any influence by Iran in Iraq is somehow nefarious and, and devious. Some of it is not. Some of it is very reasonable between two neighbors. So if you can create a, a situation or help create a situation that recognizes some of the, the pan tensions across the Middle East, then I, I think it would be worth a shot. Sir? Could you comment on the limited significance of the Middle East? No, I'll do you afterwards. Okay. Well, the, uh, the Iraqi people today and how it compares to five years ago, and the ability to make some difference. Yeah, so, oh, coming on to six. It's a. Um, 
the living con that, and that is an interesting comparison. If you compare the living conditions of Iraq today compared to a year ago, they're much better. Because a year ago, people were, were you know, terrified, were fleeing the country for their lives. Now people are feeling a little bit, well, quite a bit better. Under Saddam, Iraqis were incredibly poor. They were cut off. They were hopeless. People didn't have any cell phones, didn't have any TVs, didn't have any access to, uh, to university systems outside of Iraq. They, it was a society where there was fear and no, no possibility for, for, for any kind of development. If you, were, if you kept your head down and you planted potatoes your whole life, no one would likely bother you. But if you were a student and you wanted to found your own newspaper, you would probably find yourself in jail or killed. So it's hard to compare quality of life. Now people are free, and they have freedom of speech, and they can say what they want. And if they work hard, and they can get out of the country, and they have more income than they did in the past. Salaries are much higher now than they were. And if you go into an Iraqi's home, they have more things. They have TVs. They have, maybe they have a car. They have new, more stuff, cell phones. But they've been going through a very difficult time. And the infrastructure has never really improved. It's, there are some indications that it, it will over time, but the power and the water and the sewage remain, remain chronic and undealt with problems. The, the U.S. and the Iraqis, frankly, have been talking about doing it, but they've been busy fighting a civil war, and, and the, the, most of the, the major power plants are now offline and are being held offline as, as corruption is moving in and re replacing the insurgency as, as another, as a very insidious element. And I guess this is the last question to you, I promised. Uh, no, no, to the gentleman in the striped shirt. Yes, that's you. <laughs> and, and thank, and I'm sorry if, if I didn't get a chance to, uh, he's calling me out. <laughs> thank you, go ahead. to get the Iraqis to pay for things themselves? Yes. Well, Iran is the story now. I mean, the Iran and Iraq story are one. It is, and that's what I, what I was trying to say earlier, the, the, Middle East, the, the Iran story is the Iraq story. Do I think we're going to be rolling in and sending those 150,000 troops invading into Tehran? No, I don't. The there is a movement to get the Iraqis to, to pay for their own security and to pay for their own infrastructure. And to a degree, it is happening. And there could be a shift in which Iraq becomes a profit center. And that's what Iraqis are dangling now. Stick it out, and eventually you'll make money. That's, that is the, the, the promise that the Iraqis are holding out now so that the U.S. does not leave in a dramatic, rapid fashion. Whether that can be... A, a, whether that is a, um, a legitimate promise or it's a lie, and whether that promise is a real reason to be at war are, are questions that, that people and voters are going to have to decide for themselves. Thank you.